Next up on Sci-Fi Buzz, William Shatner dishes. And I'm not talking about food. Hello, buzzers. If you're a William Shatner fan, stay tuned. But if you're not, hang around anyway for Mark Schultz and his Denizoic tale. Some classic Harlan Ellison. And how to go about making your own sci-fi or horror movie. Mike Jarek here, Sci-Fi Buzz. Anybody out there? Oh, they're responding. Cool. Wait a minute. This is a nerd finder? Ah, the heck with that. Hi, welcome to the show. Now, the staff members on Sci-Fi Buzz says, don't show them the warehouse. But I said, what the heck? This goofy stuff is what we all thrive on, right? Look at these little things. But the best thing I found all week is this from the Next Generation series. This is from Playmates Toys. See what it is? It's a transporter room. Now, watch that Klingon in there. Want to see him come back? Ooh, and I love the sound effects and the music. Isn't that great? Well, anyway, that's Next Generation. But we must thank the original series for all this stuff. And we must thank the captain himself, Captain Kirk, William Shatner. All decks on fire alert. William Shatner is a very busy man these days. His new book, Star Trek Memories, is a fond look back at the show that has spawned six feature films and two TV spinoffs. And the budding author's futuristic tech war novels have been turned into a comic and make their way to television this week. We'll get to all that in a minute. But first, I found out that Shatner and I share a common interest, one of his former T.J. Hooker co-stars. The question I want to ask you is, what about Heather Locklear back on television? Heather Locklear could be the sign, you know, you know the, the peacock of the NBC. She should be the sign for some network. And she's Fox. She's a Fox. <laughs> The Fox Network, that's really funny. So why do you think we need another Star Trek book? Do we have all the information? The definitive one has not been written <laughs> until now. What I did was go back in time to these friends, and some are warmer friends than others, and, and uh, look into it and find out what had happened, because I was blinded by, by the fatigue and the years of, uh, of striving to learn 10 pages of dialogue a day and all that kind of thing. So. I went back and talked to the people that made the show, and, um... What was one thing you didn't know? Didn't I didn't know relationships between people that were so fetid and, um, and fated. And, um, uh, I mean, who was doing what to whom? I had no idea. You know, I, behind the scenes. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't know. I wasn't doing anything to anybody. I, did, I assumed everybody else was in the same boat, but no. They were pulling another oar. <laughs> they were in a different boat than I was. Um, you talk about some people were friendlier than others. Mm -hmm. I must have said things inadvertently over the years that uh, uh, didn't sit well with some people. Huh? And apparently, the bone of contention is that frequently I would say, you know, this isn't, this isn't what the story is about. This isn't, let's go to that scene and that's it. Make suggestions for uh, variations in the existing script that offended people who were affected by the changes. I suppose you've heard about Jimmy Doohan and his comments, well, I guess almost Shatner bashing in a way, saying that Gene Roddenberry might have thought that uh, Captain Picard was a better captain than Captain Kirk. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm sure that Jimmy, uh, his opinion was very valid, you know. Um, but uh, uh, who knows? Uh, the show was popular. Uh, uh, people seemed to like the show, and I was part of the show, and so was Jimmy. So who could tell what elements were were good and bad. Do you two speak at all? Jimmy yeah. uh, doing? I, I haven't spoken to Jimmy in a long time. I've tried to get in touch with him, but uh, he's uh, sitting someplace up in Seattle. Maybe he doesn't have a telephone. <laughs> Shatner once said Star Trek VI was the Enterprise's final big screen voyage. But at this very moment, a script is in the works that would utilize both the original cast and the next generations. They may be combining. We're, it's nothing sure. No. no, nothing is sure. So if this movie happens and they combine the cast, who would be the captain? You or Picard? I don't know. Uh, it's a, they're going to toss a coin like they do at the beginning of a football game. No, I, I'm going to be the captain. No, you're going to be the captain. I am going to be the captain. <laughs> no, I'll be the captain. Will it 
make a difference to you if if you're not a captain? Yeah. Well, then can I be a general? <laughs> Tech war. Why'd you do that? You just want to write? You want to make more money? What was the deal? Yeah, I essentially put T.J. Hooker into Star Trek. Oh. Is really what I did. Just doodling away at a storyline, and when I finished, it was a novel. And then uh, Putnam bought it, and uh, it got good notices and sold well. And they asked me to write another one. Then I began to discover what I should be doing. And gradually, the, the, the series of books evolved as a detective story and, and good fun, good, good fun adventure, light reading stuff. So if it's about T.J. Hooker, there must be a place for Heather Locklear in this. We've got to get Heather in on that. I know. I mean, Are you as much in love with Heather as I am? Shatner has opted not to play Tech Wars hunky hero Jake Cardigan on television. He has, however, directed the first episode, which airs this week. He'll also guest star in all four Tech War adventures slated to run this year. So how do you want to be remembered 100 years from now? I want to be on a loop on the science fiction network. <laughs> this interview playing again and again. And people say, I can't stand it. Turn it off. Really? And I go out with a, on a... The the, the 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 pattern the you know oh, the, 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 color, the color pattern the color bars the color bars wow. yeah I want to go out on color bars this is Tom Brush from Long Beach California a book I can recommend is the Assemblers of Infinity by Kevin Anderson and Doug Beeson a terrific novel involving uh, lunar colonies and alien nanotechnology. One of the best things I've read in years. Just over the threshold, how a great little black and white comic became a big time color TV series and some classic Harlan. Look what I found here back in the warehouse. Some of the first issues of Xenozoic Tales. You know, Mark Schultz has been putting together this little black and white gem since uh, the late 1980s. Hey, Susan, how are you? I told her to meet me here in the stacks. Hi, honey. What are you doing? <laughs> I see you're doing the same thing, huh? Yeah, I'm looking at Xenozoic Tales. Yeah, do you know about Mark Schultz? A little bit. Well, you know, he started this humble black and white comic book, and now it's been turned into a CBS Saturday morning cartoon called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Cool. The guy could make mint on merchandising alone. Award-winning comic book artist, writer Mark Schultz can't decide whether to be ecstatic or frustrated these days. He's delighted that his independent comic, Xenozoic Tales, has been turned into a TV cartoon series. But he's so overwhelmed dealing with foreign terms like property rights and licensing agreements, he's neglected his comic book. I do love drawing and writing more than anything else, and uh, I can't do that right now. But no, I'm not complaining, not really. Everyone should be so lucky have these kind of dilemmas. <laughs> Flash back to the 80s when Schultz wanted to create a comic book that captured the essence of old-time storytelling. Combining his love of classic cars with an interest in paleontology, Xenozoic Tales was born. The name was simplified to Cadillacs and Dinosaurs for mass television consumption. Up to, the, I'd say, the 50s and the early 60s, it was a type of story, this adventure story, the science fiction background that was very popular. But lately, uh, comics have become so dominated by uh, superheroes and that, that narrow genre that, in contrast, it makes my thing look uh, relatively unique. <laughs> you, you sure scared me, little fella. The TV cartoon version of Xenozoic Tales, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs hasn't been burning up the airwaves so far. That could be because the comic book appeals to a more mature reader, not exactly the audience one finds dial hopping on a Saturday morning. I think the stories are a notch above in, in uh, intelligence or several notches above your average animated show. We've been really struggling and, and the screenwriters have been responding to delivering that type of a show that uh, it's not they're not they're not idiot plots there uh, there's some actual uh, d character development and uh, logical story development within these within these stories at the moment the show's future is not of paramount concern to Schultz it's been two years since this painstaking perfectionist has turned out a new issue of his comic book and though he's obviously enjoyed his Hollywood detour Schultz is ready to go home I've always had this fantasy of being able to uh, direct movies. 
the more I see of that world, though, the more I realize what a collaborative process that is. And I think temperamentally, I'm suited uh, to have uh, being uh, being the man in charge in my my little my little pool. You know, uh, I have my one book, but I have complete control over it. If all goes according to plan, the next Xenozoic Tales should hit comic book shelves this May. Our resident commentator on the passing scene is award-winning author Harlan Ellison. When we call him award-winning, that's an understatement. Harlan has won more awards for his 58 books, more than 1,100 stories, articles, essays, and columns than any other living fantasist. His film criticism has been appearing for the last eight years in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And like our commentaries here, is called Harlan Ellison's Watching. These are some of the major awards that are available to people in the science fiction and mystery fields. This is called the Hugo. Now, the Hugo is, um, is actually uh, 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 the oldest of the science fiction awards, and it's named after Hugo Gernsback, who was a very nice old gentleman who came over from, I believe, Switzerland, but I could be wrong, but somewhere near Switzerland. And he started Electrical Experimenter and Radio Magazines back in the 20s, and in 1926, he did the first science fiction magazine, Amazing Stories, and so it is named the Hugo for him. But it is, in fact, given by the World Science Fiction Convention. Now, here's a fact very few people know. This award was designed back in the very, very early 60s, I believe, or the, or the late 50s, whatever it was, by a man named Ben Jason. Ben Jason. He still lives in Cleveland, Ohio. He's a very nice man. I think it's nice that his name is remembered. Now, you may wonder, why does this one have a little Jiminy Cricket on it? Well, because this is only a half award. I have won eight and a half Hugos. This half it was originally given to the film A Boy and His Dog, which was based on my material. And I got so cranky about it, I said, hey, you gave it to the director. What about me? I wrote the damn thing. They said, okay, but we don't have any more of the rockets, which look like giant rectal suppositories. They said, we don't, we don't have uh, one of those, but we do have this wonderful base, and we'll give you the base. And I said, and I'll take it. So that is my half Hugo. So in fact, for the record books, I've won eight and a half of those. This over here is the Nebula. Now, this was designed by uh, the widow of James Blish, the great science fiction writer. Uh, Judith uh, Blish uh, designed this uh, 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 award originally. Now, uh, come, come back this way. Uh, don't be hesitant. Do follow. No one will hurt you. This thing that looks like you might have won it at a ring toss in a circus is actually the Edgar Allan Poe Award of the Mystery Writers of America. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of... Uh, it's a nice award. It's a wonderful award to win. I've won it twice, and I'm very pleased to have won it twice. But when I, when I saw it, I said, gee, is that, I mean, it doesn't really look as elegant as it really should for an award that important. So when the time came for me to design an award, as it did for the Horror Writers of America, I designed this, a wonderful little haunted mansion done by Steve Kirk. Now, Steve Kirk is the guy who designed the Abominable Snowman in the Matterhorn at Disneyland, among other things. We took it, and I put the award inside. Now, this one here, this is a nifty one. You'll like this one. This one was created for the World Fantasy uh, Convention. The world, this is the World Fantasy Award, and it was done by the famous cartoonist and artist and writer and novelist, Gayan Wilson, uh, whose cartoons you see in Playboy all the time. Gayan Wilson did this, and it is a bust of Howard Phillips Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft, done in the style of an Easter Island statue. Very mysterious, very strange. And quite lovely, quite wonderful. And uh, this is the British uh, Fantasy Award, very prestigious award uh, given in England. And uh, this is the one that's given by the video cassette industry, the Vera Award. Now, I want you to understand something. Uh, awards are only road signs. They're only mileposts to let other people know that you have hung on a number of years long enough to get either an award or a gold watch or whatever it is. Until they give you the Nobel, you're still learning. I'm still learning. Put down that zapper. The author of The Last Unicorn has a new fantasy adventure. My name is Joshua Boone, and I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I'm really enjoying Clive Barker's new Marvel comic, The Harrowers. It uh, really ties in real well with the Hellraiser trilogy. You know, it's just a really interesting yarn, you know, occult, supernatural, exciting fantasy, and a lot of different character ranges, and there's plenty of pinhead in it. Give us a hand here at Sci-Fi Buzz with your recommendations about TV shows, movies, books.
fantasy author Peter Beagle has gained an appreciative following despite the fact that he writes at a less than prolific pace. His latest release, The Innkeeper's Song, is only his fourth novel since A Fine and Private Place was published in 1960. Beagle responds good-naturedly when asked why he keeps fans longing for new material. Believe me, as I wrote on, on one guy's book the other day, I'm trying, I'm trying. Though Beagle's work is embraced by fantasy lovers, he's yet to tap into the lucrative mainstream market. Profits from novels and short stories haven't afforded him the luxury of turning away bread and butter jobs. There was a stretch last winter when I was, in essence, working on three things on the every day. The Innkeeper's Song, an opera libretto, and an animation screenplay for Disney. And it was really like the joke about, if it's Tuesday, this must be Belgium. Have I had lunch? You know, if I had lunch, then I'm, I'm working on the Disney thing. And if I've had dinner, then I'm probably working on the book. There came three ladies at sundown. One was as brown as bread is brown. Innkeeper's Song follows the lives of three mysterious women who arrive at an innkeeper's establishment and take the place over. Oddly enough, the story came to Beagle as he quietly strummed on his guitar one day. A few years later, he decided to turn the song into a novel. You know, I just love the sheer sensual pleasure of words and music. And when I'm on writing, you know, when I'm writing well, it's like that. It's the same sort of sensuality. You know, I almost sing the stuff to myself as I'm walking around my office. And people have commented on the fact, on the, the musical quality of the language. It's not an accident. Beagle's best known work thus far is The Last Unicorn. The beloved fantasy about a unicorn's quest to free its noble race from imprisonment was turned into a feature with horror film star Christopher Lee. Beagle feels his work has matured since he wrote The Last Unicorn over two decades ago. He even goes so far as to call The Innkeeper's Song his first grown-up novel. I'm more present in the real world, or in the daily world, more of the time. Maybe it's that for somebody who's naturally unobservant and would, probably given the choice at any given moment, rather be reading a book, I'm just, I guess, better at being here than I was. and. I think my characters are deeper. Beagle may glimpse more of the real world these days, but imagined places continue to offer him the most comfort. Maybe one reason I love fantasy and old monster movies is that werewolves don't scare me. Vampires don't scare me. Human beings scare the hell out of me. We're about to give you instructions for making your own big-time sci-fi or horror film. After this pause.
Bob